Hey, good day. It's Prezo here. I'm um, hoping today to cheer you up with a little bit of uh, workshop activity. I know in these troubled times, you know, maybe it's a good idea to hunker down in the shop and do something and hopefully avoid getting that horror disease that's going around at the moment. Now, this uh, particular project is a follow-on from another project that I just completed. Now, my wife and I went away on a holiday. We bought this beautiful bronze sculpture and I made a concrete column to display it on in the garden. And uh, nearly always after the fact, somebody writes a comment and said, hey, why didn't you make a plaque for it or some sort of a nameplate for it? And I've made these before, but they were relatively large. This is one that I did for a pizza oven in the garden. And this one here is made from brass and it went on to a steel bridge uh, also in the garden. And the patterns for these are fairly easy to make because they're chunky and big. And when you make a green sand mold from it, there's, um, it's relatively easy to get the pattern out of the mold without destroying the lettering. But even so, on the, the brass one I did for the bridge, I did have an issue with uh, these little pieces, these little islands in the centre of letters like the P and the A. And uh, in case you're wondering, that that name is a French ballet term, and it refers to the position of the arms and the shoulders and neck and the head in a, a ballet position. And this was the name of the statue uh, when we purchased it. So I figured that that's probably what we should put on the plate. Now, I've been through a number of iterations with this process, and this is the first one. Um, I then added the date, uh, because I figured that was important. I tried some different typefaces, and each time I did this, I realized that I'm still going to have the same issue. These little voids in the center of the letters like the A, and the E are so tiny that if I was trying to withdraw that from a green sand mold, it's just going to fracture off. This is the next iteration here. I actually went to all capital letters and my reasoning there was that the letter E, at least anyway, didn't have the little tiny island in the center. Still had the same problem with the A and the P though. Okay, this was the, the last iteration. This one, I lowered the height of the lettering from 1.5 millimeters to 0.75 and I was able to get a much steeper draft angle. This one has a 12 degree draft angle on the lettering. 12 degrees is way more than you would normally use on a pattern for green sand casting. It's only a two and a half to three degrees. And that taper angle is important in being able to withdraw this from the sand mold. Now, even then I knew that this was gonna be a problem. So what I'm planning is to make a core, like a core in reverse out of sand and epoxy resin. Now I've done this previously in a number of my projects and it's worked really well. And there are people out there who will say, well, that's wrong, you should use sodium silicate and sand. But I find the epoxy sand works for me and I don't keep cylinders of um, CO2 gas for curing the sodium silicate on hand. But the epoxy is easy to get and it's very tough and durable. So let's get this prepped now and we'll get it into the epoxy and sand mix. And I'm going to try something, an extra ingredient, secret ingredient. So all I've done to this so far is I've been around the edges and I've sanded that smooth and I've sanded the face of the lettering on the top of that uh, 3D printed pattern. And all I'm going to do here is get some wax and we're just going to rub that into the surface of the pattern. This is just um, a Canuba wax polish normally used on furniture but I find it works with the epoxy and sand mix fairly well. So I'm just going to rub that in. This is essentially just going to be a mold release. And I'm just going to get a brush here and just work it into all the little corners and nooks and crannies and then try and remove the excess. So remember the thing that's going to create the biggest problem here is having the sand and epoxy stick anywhere and make it difficult to get this pattern out of the, the finished mold. So even if we got a little bit too much wax, that's probably a good thing. So remember, the draft angle is really important. And the more you can have, the better. And when I was modeling this, uh, I did actually did this one in Autodesk Inventor, but Fusion's pretty much the same thing. Uh, I found that if you were to draw the sketch for the lettering on the top of this section here and then try and extrude it upwards with a taper angle, it would fail 
pretty much uh, anything beyond two degrees of draft angle it would fail and it's to do with the geometry of the lettering itself so what I found worked better was to create a, a new plane above the surface draw the text on that and then extrude downwards into the base and I sort of finished up with 12 degrees that was as much as I could get before the extrusion failed now different typefaces give different results too uh, the one that I'm using here is called Aerial Rounded Bold uh, and I use that one because it doesn't have a lot of sharp corners okay so we've got most of our wax in there now we're just going to sort of rub the excess off that it's nice and waxy the bits you can see that are still in the corners and the centers of the letter zero or the number zero for example that's going to get displaced when we ram the sand and epoxy mixture down onto that so I'm not worried about that okay I've made this uh, very simple wooden form here it's been waxed on the inside and the screws mean that I can remove the sides and extract the sand and resin mold without damaging it now a 3D printed pattern will go on the bottom of that and we're going to pack into there our sand and resin mix now this is all about resolution. The finer our sand will be, the better the quality of the finished mold is going to be and therefore the finished metal plate. If we were to use sand with big crystals, large crystals, it means that they won't pack into the sharp corners in the bottom of that mold and then we're going to get sort of an uneven patchy finish on the finished metal casting. So we're after really fine sand. Now the sand that I'm using here is called Ballina White Sand. It comes from the beaches of northern New South Wales. It's almost a pure white silica sand. And what I've done is I've run that through the finest sieve that I've got. And that's the residue that was left over after I sieved that amount of sand. So it's going right through the metal sieve without a problem. There's just a little bit of organic material that got um, withdrawn from that toward the end there. Now, Here's the controversial part. I'm going to mix, or I have already mixed into that, about 10% of this stuff. Just ordinary talcum powder. Now I've checked up on this. Talc is a mineral, right? And it's an ingredient in ceramics and also in certain paints, uh, cosmetics. Um, there's a long list of places where this stuff is used. And my reasoning is that the talc is very, very finely ground. And by adding the talc, we're got a better chance of filling in some of the air spaces around sand crystals themselves. Now, I don't know what the ratio could be. Um, I, like I said, it's about 10%. And I've got no idea how this is going to play out when we pour the hot molten metal into the mold. It may just completely burn out. I don't know. But this is all about experimentation and I'm keen to give it a crack. So let's see how it goes. So I'm going to mix up my resin now, we'll get that in there, we'll pack it into the mould and fingers crossed it'll turn out perfect. I'm using a West Systems epoxy, it's a marine grade epoxy but I'd imagine that any epoxy resin would do. So in this instance we're not really bothered about air bubbles in the epoxy. By the time we mix this into the sand there's going to be lots of trapped air in there anyway. Uh, and I don't think you want too much epoxy because it's going to generate a lot of smoke and gas when the hot metal hits it. So this is more of a binder. Its job is just simply to hold the sand crystals together, uh, not to totally exclude the airspace between the, the sand. So we want air in the mix because that's going to allow uh, any gases to escape into the surrounding green sand mould. So this little mould that I'm making is going to be put into a flask and rammed down with normal green sand as well. So we do want uh, the, the gases to be able to escape. Alright, so that's thoroughly mixed. We're going to put that into our uh, sand here, sand and talc. Now, I just do this by eye. You sort of mix it, you soon work out what the correct ratio is. If you're really worried about it, you can mix it all by weight. I just don't bother. <laughs> Never had a failure yet. So what you're looking for is the same consistency as green sand. It should hold together when you compress it, but it shouldn't be so wet that it leaves resin on your gloves. 
gonna get this in another container so I can mix it with my fingers. You can see that's still way too dry, so I need more resin in that. Alright, I think that's the sort of consistency that I'm after there. It sort of should hold together and it should still be friable though. You should be able to still break it up. Remember that as the resin cures, it's going to grab hold of the sand crystals or sand grains around it and bind the whole lot together. Okay. So we're just going to start packing that into the mould. So this is just straight sand and resin just to top this off. Uh, I'm going to compact that fairly well and then we'll just strike the top off. Okay, um, that's as flat as that needs to be on top there. I compacted that down fairly well. Okay, let's leave this. We'll come back tomorrow and see how it looks. Okay, so I'm guessing now what we need to do is try and loosen this, uh, tapping it, uh, levering it. Uh, we need to be able to withdraw that by taking it almost vertically out of the hardened sand and epoxy mix now. And this is the point where uh, pieces are going to break off if we don't get this right. So I've just hot glued a little handle onto that so I can sort of get some tapping going left and right, front to back try and jar it loose and then we'll try withdrawing that. Absolutely nothing. Alright, it's not looking good is it? Okay, well so far that's a complete fail. Um, I can't get any movement out of that whatsoever. So I'm going to put the whole block in the oven and try and get the PLA up to about 150 degrees C. And hopefully it'll start to shrink and soften and uh, we might be able to get some movement there. It means we've got to destroy the pattern, but I can print another one easily. Just had this in the oven for about five minutes and it's starting to soften on the corners there. And I can leave that up. Uh, with a probe, but I'll give it a bit longer. I think it's uh, it's going to come free, but I'd imagine that the outer edges are going to get soft first, and I'd still be stuck further in. So I'll give it a bit more time in the oven. Well, stupidly, I forgot to turn the camera on during the big reveal when I removed this 3D printed pattern. But what happened was, uh, I came out of the oven. It was soft enough that I could see it flexing very easily. The hot glue didn't let go, so I was able to just sort of wiggle this backwards and forwards, and eventually remove that. Now, there's the result, and I couldn't be happier with the quality of this, except for one thing, and that's the centre of this letter A. And if we look at that there, 
you can sort of, I don't know, you can still see the, the sand and the resin trapped in that little void there. And I guess given the size of that, it's not surprising that that broke off. Now I'm going to go ahead and cast this anyway. I figure that later on I can restore that feature just using a Dremel tool and a very fine burr. And we should be able to make that look okay. But everything about this has worked out really well. Even the little accent on the top of the letter E has formed correctly. So I'll go ahead and cast this now. I guess the next thing is, are we going to sort of uh, create some sort of <laughs> a toxic fume fire? I don't know. Uh, when I've done this in the past making cores, the metal has formed correctly. The resin and the sand eventually sort of deteriorate and break down but it seems to hold together long enough for the metal to form correctly before it freezes. So, yeah, let's, let's keep going. Uh, looking good. If you're um, looking at all this mess, wondering what I'm up to, I'm actually shooting two separate videos today and I'm doing three castings. Uh, today I'm only going to concentrate on this one for this video, <laughs> but just to save setup time and fuel and everything else, I'm going to do these two other castings they will make it into their own separate video at a later stage. Now in terms of making up this mould, it's pretty straightforward really because all the hard work's already been done. We're just sort of creating um, a container for a sand and epoxy mould, something to keep it all aligned and everything while we pour the metal. So, not too much expertise required to do this part. Okay, well there's my sand and epoxy mould and what I need to do now is work out some way of getting the liquid metal into that cavity and out to a riser. Normally what you do is just cut a gate on both sides and then attach your sprue and your riser. Can't do that in this case, so what I've done instead is I've marked off a centre line uh, at right angles to the edge of my uh, cavity there and I've transferred those marks to the side of the drag and then I've done the same thing on the cope. And I propped this up on a bit of wood because it's got pins hanging down at both sides there. And I've marked off the same geometry on this piece of wood here. And that's going to allow me to put a pattern piece, which looks like that, in the bottom of that mould. Now I can attach my tapered sprue uh, this way. So the tapered sprue goes there. And I've got this comedy sized riser, which um, is probably overdoing it for this size casting, but I just happen to have it there, so it'll be fine. If I ran the sand around that, what that will give me is sort of a lid to keep the, the metal contained and some way in and out for the metal.
Okay, so there's the way in for the metal and the way out and we've effectively got a connection at the top there that will allow that liquid metal to go into the mould. Now if you're looking at all of this and saying, geez Mark, this is complicated, <laughs> you could probably make this thing on a CNC router in no time. Well that's true, but I don't have a CNC router and uh, I just think this is interesting. Um, I know it's, you know, it, it appears to be very, very complex, but I'm doing this for the first time. I'd imagine that there are shortcuts you can take. There are better ways of working out the, the runners and the gates and all that sort of stuff. But um, just let's take this as an experiment, see how it goes. It might all be a total failure yet, but we won't know till we give it a try. Okay, with that mould done now, I'm ready to light up the furnace, but before I do that, I want to show you this. Now, I was in touch with um, Old Foundryman, and if you watch his channel, you know what a, a master craftsman he is, but he, uh, well, let's say he encouraged me to go and buy some better quality alloy for my castings. And when I first got started in this hobby of metal casting, I was melting anything that I thought looked like aluminium alloy. And it turns out that if you use rubbish alloy, you get rubbish castings, and that's what was happening. So this is good quality 601 grade uh, alloy, and I went to a foundry in Brisbane with a fistful of cash, and I offered the guys here five dollars a kilo for this material. It actually, cost them I think four dollars a kilo, and they were great about it. They even helped me to load it into my car, and I think I bought um, uh, forty kilos of the stuff. And when I got them, they were that size. I've cut this one in half so it will fit into my crucible. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing if it makes a difference. I'm sure it will. about this alloy is that there's almost no dross. It's, it's very, very clean. That's about all I'm going to get out of there. All right, let's see how we go here. Uh, I didn't notice any smoke or fumes coming out of this when I poured the material. Hey, check that out. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. Here's the sand and epoxy. And you can see it's charred, but you can also see uh, the indentations where the lettering would be. So that's held up to the heat of that aluminium quite well. Let's dig it all out and clean it off. So there's the whole thing, the tapered sprue. There's our riser. That's probably oversized for what we're doing here. That seems to work that okay. And here's our, uh, what effectively was the, the runner. This whole part that I'm making here is quite delicate. So I've got it lightly clamped down, or firmly clamped down I should say a block of aluminium on the mill table. I'm just going to pass backwards and forwards and machine off that uh, remaining material. That'll give us a relatively flat back and then we can file the rest.
Well, that's close enough. I'll flip this over now and we'll deal with the front. What I'm planning to do here is to just lightly draw file that and then powder coat it and then sand it to expose the lettering and uh, I'll need to go around the edges and tidy up a few little defects there as well. That's flattened off the tops of the letters and numbers but we've only got 0.75 millimeters of height to deal with here so Got to be a little bit careful we don't go too deep. Still got to fix up the centre of the letter A there. I'll, I think I'll drill that out and then just use a tiny chisel just to chip away it and get the triangular shape in the centre. These holes will eventually be countersunk and we'll use countersunk screws to attach this to the concrete column. Now I'm just going to clean up the, the outer edges and then we'll get it powder coated. Okay, let's clean up the outer edge. I'll hit that with the scotch bright wheel and get these countersunk and oh, I've got to take care of that letter A. Well, that just gives me some marking out to work to. I'll try and drill a little hole in the centre there and then just uh, work away at it. Just made up a little tiny chisel out of a broken end mill and I've just been chopping away at the metal around the edge of that triangle and it's working rather well. Can't see a thing I'm doing without a magnifying lens though. Once you get the outline established, the rest is fairly straightforward. This is all going to fill up with powder paint later on or powder coat. So we just want to get a, a bit of a rough opening, triangular. There it is there. I'll probably blow that out with compressed air and just get a scriber in there and just pick away at it. That's all right, happy with that. I just uh, powder coated that in a satin bronze and it's a uh, you know, pretty good color match. So I'm gonna go and get the highlights cleaned off the top of this now. That's done a pretty good job except for this little section of the letter E and just the tips of the letter T and possibly that little accent there. So uh, they are slightly rounded and lower than the surrounding area uh, and I don't want to sand too far so I may have to get a little tiny file like a riffler file and try and just clean up those areas. I think we'll get it. Certainly it looks better with the, the higher contrast between the aluminium and the bronze.
All right, that's as good as I'm going to get that, I think. So I'm going to go and give this a clear powder coat now just to protect the exposed aluminium. And we're done. Well, there it is with the clear coat on. And now we're going to drill some holes in the concrete column and get it attached. These screws are nickel plated brass so they should stand up to the exposure quite well. Okay, boys and girls, that's how you make your own miniature cast metal nameplates. And I'm guessing this would work in other metals as well. Uh, probably lower melting point alloys would be better than, say, something like uh, brass. But to make this work, all you need is your 3D printed pattern. You need your sand and epoxy mold. You need some way of getting the metal into the mold and up into the riser. Uh, just a simple pattern piece like that will do and uh, Bob's your uncle. Now I'd love to see what other people do with this. Uh, this is uh, the first attempt for me. It shows a lot of scope and a lot of promise and tag me on Instagram at Prezzo58 if you get something like this to work for you. I'd love to see what other people can do with it. But there it is as a project. Uh, I'm happy with it. It's worked out the way I wanted. And uh, join me on the next video, it's going to be more about metal casting and in particular the pain and humiliation <laughs> of trying to cast things in metal. Uh, believe me, the last project I did did not go the way I expected. Should be out in a few days. Uh, but for now, uh, Prezzo signing out. Thanks for watching.